the topic of the panel we're going to have is design for agency and creating systems that inspire us um, and that create agency in everyone. But I would like to start with a question that is, and what if human is not the problem? I'll try to form a little background story before I'm going to introduce our amazing panelists. What happened as design and its history transitioned from the industrial design that was done for mass production and a highly functional modernism to uh, the design we knew in the 90s that was very much user-centered and was very much driven by marketing. And what's happening now is we can notice that the design approach is trans transitioning once again, and I think the WeShare Fest, it's a, it's a good example, because we're moving from designing for use to designing for participation. Let's call it agency. And uh, there are many sessions during the WeShare Fest that can prove it. I mean, you can just look about, you can talk about distributed manufacturing, civic tech, and so on and so on. So I have a quote that I'm going to read. The new rule is that if we are a participant, we are, by default, a moderator, a curator, and an editor for others. It's a quote from Kipling. So we really need to develop the capacity to engage and participate with the others. And um, I think today we start to have this interaction between design and science that starts to help us change a little bit the approach. I think what you were talking about, we see more digital science and, and design approaches. But what we really have to do is not only to design the framework, but the design has to, be, has to participate itself. Um, so, I will not take too much time. I'm going to, just by framing, maybe start and introduce... Well, Alistair, we don't have to introduce you. You, you, you already, I think, introduced yourself very well. But uh, we have with us uh, Selena Savage, who is the co-author of Unpleasant Design, a co-founder of the Unpleasant Design team. And uh, you all have background in architecture, urban planning and uh, media design. So. Um, Alistair, do you want to add something apart from the introduction you have already done? No. Or? So maybe... <laughs> Thanks. Um, so maybe, Selena, I'm going to leave you a moment to, to introduce yourself better. Okay. Um, well, uh, hello, everyone. <laughs> um, um, I would like to introduce the kind of connection of unpleasant design to the topic that we will discuss uh, this evening. And uh, to generally uh, briefly introduce unpleasant design, it, um, it started as a research into how um, so-called silent agents are um, employed and deployed around cities in public space to control what and, and how and when can be done without any negotiation between the humans. Um, so uh, you can think of a basic uh, example as a, of, of the... Uh, park bench with central armrests with, with which you cannot negotiate but you just cannot sleep there. There are anti-homeless studs and there are all these anti-homeless um, installations which are uh, particularly popular in Paris. Um, I guess also in London. Uh, we had a lot of contributors and, and, and interested people from Paris. As long as you have homeless people, you have also um, anti-homeless agents. Um, so this brings us to the, this question of not, no, no, not only the non-human agency, but also the, the notion of who is this design for and how are people represented in these systems? Uh, who decides that it is unacceptable to sleep on a bench or to skate on a bench? Um, who decides and how is this um, articulated in a form um, as to whether teenagers are going to do uh, window shopping and hang out in shopping malls or, or they're just going to be deterred by uh, annoying uh, high frequency sounds. Uh, so we, yeah, we, we have this theory of unpleasant design with which we can dress public space or publicness, I would say, um, with which we can um, evaluate as uh, whether something is or not unpleasant uh, based on the the few basic questions. Uh, one would be also, is there something public or an expectancy of, of a public something 
uh, which can be or, or not uh, shared among people. Uh, in, in the sense of a park, it's obviously clear, it's public space and, uh, and everyone should have access in this. When you put a bench and you prohibit certain behaviors of, on that bench, uh, Camden bench is a particularly popular example of unpleasant design. And it also appears in public space and it, it, hmm. pro, it, it has like 30 things that it yeah. prohibits. And Selena, if I would, I, I'm gonna maybe try to ask some questions that, because um, we have discussed the topic a lot and it, uh, was a nerve-wracking experience. It's, it's fascinating. I, I have this question for you, both of you. Uh, why should we move away from the user-centered design and what's the difference, in your opinion? Do you want to? you want me to take that one um, first? Um, so the way I often think about this is um, politicians tend to see, or, or politics, we tend to ask um, people what they see systems as. Whereas actually, um, a, a designer might ask the opposite question, which is what the system sees you as. Um, so throughout kind of most of human history, to every industrial economy at the time, you've been something. Uh, obviously, initially, one of the things you could be was a slave. And so, um, <laughs> the, like, uh, basically, that economy kind of, then, then later on, of course, you became a serf, and then you became a kind of worker, and then you had the feudal system, and you, so you could become a commoner, and that was an option you, you, that you could have. Um, of course, uh, uh, then, you know, it took a long time, actually, for the idea of the citizen to kind of emerge, which is incredible, sort of unique, um, like extraordinary sort of accident of history in a way that we could arrive at this, this noble idea of the citizen and have evolved what that means. But of course, more recently, you know, we've had industrial economies that, that treat you as the worker or as the consumer or as the voter. Isn't it amazing? Politicians refer to you as a voter, not a citizen, right? Because basically they see you in terms of what they can get out of you. So, um, and of course, now what's happening is, I, I would say, in the next generation is that um, to, to, to the kind of data capitalism model, you've literally become a kind of a unit of data. You've become a data commodity, uh, which, can, which can be sold. Um, and I think probably, if I was being predictive, I think we're moving into a future where you actually become a behavioral commodity, because increasingly the, the, your, your behavior in your mental health is going to be on sale as well. So, um, like every, and that's, in a way, that's the hidden thing. So when we say the user of a design, uh, now user-centered design sounds lovely, but of course it's, it's also a way of saying, oh, we're gonna do this to you, right? And we're gonna make it as, feel as lovely as we can for us to do this to you. Mm -hmm. So um, the central question, and, and I think Thomas, where's Thomas, he's around somewhere. There he is. You know, Thomas, you wrote a great piece this week in which you made this point really, really clear. If you want to talk about the politics of the next half century, you need to talk about the word ownership. And don't stop talking about the word ownership. Every time anyone pitches anything, say, nice future, who owns it? And what is owned in this future, right? Because always, always people are trying to own people. Um, and, and so the, the, the issue with the user is, say, oh, you're the user of my platform, but it's another way of saying, oh, on some level, I own you. Um, and in the same way that you could own workers. So um, the, the big kind of transition, if you like, for me, the difference between user-centered design and, and whatever you want to call it, I would just call it citizen-centered design, is this idea that we, we don't just make beautiful services and beautiful products that make stuff beautifully convenient. We also have this question about... The smart, what, right, the yeah. user interacting with a smart right, device. Right, we, we also have this question of, okay, what are you to that system? And, and then you start having a different conversation. If I may intervene, um, I would also like to connect to this uh, notion of the user, because the notion of the user was never really a notion of an a, uh, undefined individual. It was a generalizable individual, something that can be generalized and thus um, is uh, entirely uh, fictional. It, right. There was never any user that anything was ever designed for. Yeah, and you see so, that in housing, right? Yeah, All housing it, is designed for this imaginary it's average for the user. 60 centimeter module still. Right. Um, and measured by it. And, and so what is interesting is um, to, to uh, make a similar lineage, but going a little bit less in history, um, looking at the, um, the history of human computer interaction or interaction with technology, where um, the, the paradigm starts from the idea of controlling the system, mm -hmm. but actually creating the system in such a way that it is really attuned at a specific purpose. 
and then generalizing the system. So, you know, if you had a computer, it was supposed to just run one operation, mm -hmm. and, and that was, it was programmed, and people worked on programming that thing so that a human could push a button and where perhaps the user, execute it. Where the user, the user very user, much comes from the... The user did not exist yet. yet. And then the user came, the user who was using this interface, mm -hmm. and since we have this interface, we have this idea of yeah. the generalizable user for which the interface can be generalized. And um, uh, with this lineage, we had come to the, today to the um, understanding, but we also have a long... Um, kind of history of designing these personas which are basically mm -hmm. users and, and, and a lot of human computer interaction is about personas and interaction design as well. Yeah. Personas who are like fictional, re well researched but nevertheless no ones. Yeah. And and now finally we understand okay there are no that such no ones and actually the, the ratio of energy invested in creating these personas versus their uh, usefulness, I guess, never really... Yeah. Um, although, although what's happening is the two are converging in a weird way, right? Because yeah. where previously the they'd have had, say, five user types, yeah. so much data about, was it, yeah. I mean, as Google say, they can predict within 90% accuracy whether your next relationship is going to work based on the data they yeah. already have mm -hmm. about you. Yeah. So it's still not you, it's yeah. just a really, really accurate proxy. But it is also the, the kind of philosophical uh, understanding that we have of our world where everything that happened is going to affect everything that is going to come in a way that we can articulate. And I think this is, the, this is where we're stuck because we think, oh, we need just more data and we are basing all these future projections based on, on the past. But if you, if you address the topic of, uh, of a user that is sort of an, as you said, maybe not even existing individual, which is kind of interacting with uh, a button finally, buy or sell or order, you know, in this kind of opaque background. Yeah. But I, if, you, if you start to look at what's happening now, where you have those, I would call them participants, for, for lack of a better word, that are not only interacting with something, but they're interacting with each other, and mm -hmm. they're interacting with the environment mm -hmm. in which the interactions are much more pleasant, I think it's very hard to start to use the personas or the, the, the yeah. user-centered design uh, in environments like communities, or especially if you just look at how WeShare works, where everything is constantly changing, yeah. I think. Yes, yeah, somehow our ability to articulate and treat a, a lot of activity, not only human, has uh, hmm. improved a lot. And with it, somehow, um, our assumption that the humans need to be designed out of the system yeah. has emerged. That the human Human is a problem are the weak link mm. in security, in uh, prediction, the humans are unpredictable, and all, and all that. You have the perfect I system, think, yeah, I think and then the human comes and makes... We're mindset where we have to design the perfect system, mm. but we, we are stuck with humans. Right. So how would you design, do you want to? Uh, well, I was just going to say, I think what's really interesting about that, uh, of course I'm thinking about housing again, right, is, is that if there is to be a transition from seeing people as just users to seeing them as some kind of active citizens or participants. It won't be brought about by just the warm words, mm. right? It comes back from this deep realization. So to take the example of housing, there's a point when you realize that if we are going to build a city the size of New York or London every five weeks for the, for the, for the next, you know, whatever it is, 33 years, um, if we, we, we literally will never be able to do it if we treat people as consumers or, and borrowers. Literally, there's not a government, or a, as Robert Neuwirth says, there's not a, a government or, 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 or a company that can produce that much debt in order to yeah. do it. And, and so we ha in, in housing, we have this deep mindset, mindset shift um, from seeing people and housing as a problem to be solved to the idea of seeing people as the intrinsic capacity and then ironically, you don't ever have to build a house. Mm -hmm. So the way, the way to solve a housing crisis is not to build a single house, it's to give everybody the capacity to build homes for themselves. Absolutely. But we've got to understand that there's a strategic imperative. It's not yeah. just that this isn't a nice political thing to do, that literally there are big problems that we can only solve if we, f we flip yeah. that round. So do you have maybe an idea, how can we in that case, following on what you've said, uh, design for, for those participants instead of designing for, for those users. And I think an interesting point that came up when we were talking before is that the story I really liked about the skaters. Um, you know, because it very often brings the question of designing for what we, uh, you call the minorities. 
Maybe you could. Yeah, so th this is again points back to the, the, the question of unpleasant design, um, where we identify, of course, that always unpleasant design is um, addressing um, or is attacking or um, somehow discriminating a minority group, such as homeless people, but also skaters. What, what we can raise as a question is what if today we have a 1% uh, uh, citizens? Uh, skaters and we, uh, the 99% agree that this is a behavior we can deter at anywhere where, where we don't uh, enjoy it. Um, and if we do design space in that way, what happens when 70% of people become skaters? How do we do away with all these interventions? How, mm -hmm. do, we, how do we make designs so that we can become skaters also? Or maybe how do you design for the 1%? Yeah, I mean, what you it's this thing where if you change, if you if switch out the word design, I always mm -hmm. think you can switch out for purpose or telos, yes. mm -hmm. and you realize that the, there's a point where design at that point has just become decision making. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the two have sort of met in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, design is an agent in, in this discussion, and this is actually interesting. Yeah. The, the design uh, for uh, designers' partic participation in the article that, that inspired us to talk yeah. uh, in this way by Kevin Slavin, where uh, he argues that actually designers' participation is not about including citizens and about anyhow, anyhow humanly managing this chain, but actually about designing with things that are being designed. Right, and I mean this is also why I'm interested in uh, in automation, right? Because mm -hmm. usually the com automation conversation is the robots are coming for our jobs, right? And, and as, as I think it was Stephen Hawking, he had this great thing, did anyone see this, where Stephen Hawking was like, um, our AI is the single biggest thing we have to fear. And then a month or so later, he came out again and said, sorry, correction, the ownership of AI is the biggest thing we have to fear. Mm. Right, which is, I loved it. Like, okay, you're smart. Oh, well, we, we knew he was smart, right? But, um, <laughs> he, he's proved that. Um, uh, and uh, the, this, the, this is the reason why automation is interesting, right? Because, um, like initially, you have designers. The notion that design knowledge is in the head of a person called a yeah. designer, and therefore these well-meaning designers will kind of, you know, oh, we'll consult you, which is mm -hmm. pretty rubbish. And then, you'll, then we'll sort of, oh, we'll have some user, in, you know. And so, and, and then the next level on. So that that was the kind of, that was kind of bullshit 101 when when we I think when we were training as architects was this and that was this idea that oh you're going to consult with people, and and or you're going to let them be participants or something and of course nothing changed the economics didn't change. Yeah, this but, is the, the the disaster of participatory design right. where well people actually don't want to participate and right. uh, actually people want people do not want the agency that you are giving them to people mm. people actually don't want to assume it because that's what you are for right. you should make some decisions for them as right. well. They have agency but, but, through you. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, but then the next layer up, right, was then, you know, w which is what I was batting on about in uh, sort of 2013-ish, was sort of, okay, can we actually reframe the economics where we can use things like open source to, uh, to drive down the costs and the overheads of a designer by not resolving the same problem to a point where we can work for the 99% instead of the 1%. And I still think that's possible, and I still think it's really important that we do that. But actually, the next layer beyond that is actually where you begin to realize that the distinction between the designer and the non-designer just starts to blur into nothingness where you don't need a professional designer, it's actually a problem of knowledge. And as soon as you can have patterns, you can have automated open design knowledge mm -mm. that people can interact with and speak to in an intelligent way, then all the things you say, oh, you can't let people design without a designer because they'll go wrong. Well, not if yeah. you make a system in which they can't go wrong. I so think it gets really, really interesting where we move to a future where yeah. literally, and I, the, I've always re resisted the cliche of, oh, we're all designers, but literally that it turns mm -hmm. out, awkwardly for me, that is actually the future we might be heading towards. Yeah, and I think the role of the traditional designer is still there. It's just much more humble. Right. You know, so uh, it's, it's, it's not a question, no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering. Um, I'm wondering if this doesn't sound the same as, as we had sounded before. If we say that suddenly now we are all going to be designers, I don't think that is actually the point. Uh, I think the point is that we need to, we're in the moment now where we are designing these systems and that's actually the interesting part. Right. We are designing systems right. that will enable things to be designed 
where the question of design is not anymore on the actual um, orchestration of, ma of material or matter, mm. but on the, the design of the system. So who is going to be designing these systems? The and systems. How? Yeah. Who takes and decisions at yeah. a higher and, and, level? And there yeah. will be human right. decisions in So the, the role yeah. of design is almost simply to solve the next problem. Yeah. Right? Like to kind of, to, to, or to propose yeah. something else. To go like, to that level, yeah. 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 And there, there are going to, again, be specialists who will know how to code and mm. people who won't know how to code. And I think that's interesting because I, I had a discussion uh, yesterday with a banker who was interested in cryptocurrency but very un-technically, uh, uh, um, well, uh, equipped or however. Uh, but but, but uh, he thought that architects, uh, that an, being an architect is actually uh, a job that will forever last. That's what he thought. Uh, the architects, we will always have buildings, and that's why he thought architects will always be needed. Uh, I told him this is totally uh, already rubbish, because mm. we don't have any more... If you look at... And most buildings have nothing to do with architects. Uh, no, and, and if you look at, for example, job searches, if you, if you search for a job as an architect, you will only come, come across software architect's position mm -hmm. and not architect's position. Yeah. And this is actually uh, a great thing to see because this is what, what, what we need today. Even uh, classically trained architects need to become software architects in mm -hmm. order to mm -hmm. control the, the, the production of these tools. Which brings me to the question of literacy. Mm -hmm. And actually, because we're raising complexity, as we've said, we, we, we start to move into designing uh, systems and strategies, and uh, the complexity is highly raising. And uh, in general, in everything that happens, I think we have sort of those terms that can be quite, quite complex to, to certain people. We have you know, artificial yeah. intelligence, we have, uh, I don't know, IP. I mean, we have many things that are very hard to understand for a lot of people, and we have more and more data that's in the cloud, and we give more and more data. And I think the whole concept of designing systems, especially complex systems, requires literacy on both sides. So one is to understand the, the tools we have now to... Well, it, it, it's also, it's not just literacy, it's heuristics, mm. right? So, I mean, the example I always give of this um, is, you know, if you ask most people, certainly of our generation, it's not, I think it's not true of the kind of next generation after us, but of everyone of our generation who can code, and say, who taught them to code? And they will laugh in your face, right? Of course, they taught themselves to code. Mm. Um, and, and what they do is they kind of drill down to the next yeah. layer, all right? So there's this big transition from the black box model of code mm -hmm. to this model where you can have heuristics. Yeah. And that's something that we're thinking quite a, a, a lot about with, um, and John Reese and I, who's, who's mm. John's really the, he, he's the kind of genius behind a, a lot of this stuff. And he, um, it's this question, a conversation we have quite a lot, which is how do we, um, there's, a, there's a kind of term in the world of code, which is it's, it's turtles all the way down. So I don't know if you know mm. Terry Pratchett, where the world's on the back of a turtle. But basically, that's how code works. Mm. It's turtles on turtles on turtles. Mm. And so you've basically got to find a way that somebody can always drill into the next layer. Mm. Because not everybody will know everybody, know, know everything. But there's yeah. always got to be someone who, and, and who has that opportunity to go and go, OK, I have a reason to want to find out, and I can and they can always kind of upskill and upskill to the next level. Mm -hmm. And unless you design these systems mm -hmm. in that kind of modular way, mm -hmm. in that stack way, so people can drill in and drill mm -hmm. in, drill in, and, mm -hmm. and learn their way up, yeah. um, then we're in a, a big problem. Not least because we end up in a situation in 50 years' time when the air conditioning of society breaks and no one's around yeah. who knows how to mend it anymore. But I think something that really speaks to me is you know the question about n not what the system is for you, but what you are, you know, for the system to the system. And I guess this is the again the question of the tools for us, the literacy for people that kind of gonna create or, or design those systems. But at the same time, also the literacy of the the participants, let's call them. And maybe the question also of uh, technology and what's the role of technology, you know, in agency. Is it actually yeah, I'm, I'm increasingly interested in these uh, blatant technocratic scenarios that we uh, are constantly presented with and we have somehow got used to um, simply accept. Um, so we, we talk more and more about smart contracts, we talk more and more about um, cryptocurrencies and specifically about uh, getting this um, um, responsibility out of people, so thus uh, mm. reducing human error and corruption. But I think we are at this moment where we are able to also think more creatively and not simply uh, take out the humans mm -hmm. from the equation because 
well, I mean, who are we to take humans out of the equation? Um, and uh, even like who is AI to do this? Or um, I think that somehow we, um, we, we have a kind of two uh, lines of thinking uh, within the people that are informed about uh, machine learning and, yeah. and artificial intelligence. Yeah. Yeah. One is the kind of black stack option, hoping that somehow finally humans will be erased because because human is the just, problem they're just not doing well and yeah. and it's true we're not doing very well on earth but what is the measure like do we yeah. actually yeah. have another earth where everything is going well mm -hmm. um, and the other um, the other part is the, the the literacy so i think that what we need to work on is the literacy in making smart contracts mm -hmm. with not not simply outsourcing contract making to smartness mm -hmm. uh, and also like this idea of upskilling citizens uh, to, to, you know, everyone says, what's going to be our job in the future? Well, one of the jobs is keeping the automation accountable. For example, right? yeah, right. yeah, and, yeah and, that's and so, be a very so, and, and asking questions yeah. and proposing changes. And yeah. the, you know, the, the, the go-to philosophical example of this everyone uses is, is the, the self-driving car thing, right? Mm. Which is, you know, the paradox of who does it kill? Does it kill the oldies or the babies mm -hmm. or whatever, right? And mm -hmm. uh, and the answer is there is no answer. The only answer is that you actually make that code. Um, open and, and a, a civic common good in such a way that anybody, even you know someone's grandma, can go to Siri or whoever or Alexa or whoever it is who wins, and uh, says, um, "Okay, in this situation, what would that do?" And it answers them. And, and so actually, like you find ways to allow and, and encourage and, and, and teach people to be citizens. And this is a really big deal, right? Because for a whole bunch of reasons, I have some deep problems with the current formulations of universal basic income. I think it needs to be a citizen dividend, not a basic universal income, but we, we won't go there. That's your moment. Alice. Right. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, don't, I don't think we've got time for that. Um, uh, but the other side of the coin that I, I don't, everyone's yakking on about universal basic income, which is the methadone approach, right? It's mm -hmm. the kind of medicate people and they'll go away approach. Yeah. Whereas what we actually need to move is, is uh, to the other, look at the other side of the equation, yeah. which is radical upskilling of citizens. Mm -hmm. So we need to kind of boost this whole citizen economy. Now, the last time mm -hmm. we had citizen uh, institutions to which you were individually accountable, they were religions, mm -hmm. right? The community did everything through, the, through religion, and that's how kind of everything ran. So we, we probably agree that we would like to have a more secular agnostic framework for society and if we want to do that we've got to think really really hard about what kind of new learning and working institutions we have to create to scale the notion and the idea of citizen work and what is it that a citizen work does and, and what are our responsibilities and our skills and our rights to be ready to do that citizen mm. work. Exactly, to make people literate in making contracts between right. each other with technology, with uh, God if they like to, yeah. uh, you know, but... but, but it's making, Google, right? Isn't yeah. it God? It's Google in the future. <laughs> it starts with G, yeah. yeah so. <laughs> For the time now. So, yeah, I think we're um, slightly going into those bigger topics. And uh, as we've said, so from designing labs and chairs, we're slowly moving into designing economy and politics and mobility and trying to answer the bigger questions. Um, and so, so how would you, you know, agency, how, who owns agency now? You know, basically, if you look, and this was a conversation we had with Liz, um, is that there is a lot of agency in if you look at that way, in big companies and, and, and people that are decision makers and how would you distribute uh, agency and what, what would be the design approach for that? Is there one? Or is it a too big of a question? No, I mean, I can... Is I it mean, ownership? It, it, it's, it's, it's ownership, right? And, and like, the question of, of kind of, of how do you or how would you or why would you because sometimes this can seem a bit depressing, right? Because it can mm -hmm. seem into moving into this future in which people are not empowered as citizens, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I think it's worth flipping it the other way, which is to say, well, why wouldn't you? Like, if you look back through history, we see again and again that tyrannical systems get created that infringe on each other's and other systems' rights, and eventually there's a fight and a revolution, and then people push back, right? Sadly, it's not very often. Um, and generally, revolutions with guns don't work. They don't go well, right? But, you know, you have certain key moments in history where, um, you, you know, you do that. So, in a way, you, I think you can rely on people to be citizens. Mm -hmm. What you have to look at is why would we ever be uncitizens? Because I think when you get most people privately in the room, 
they, they prefer to be a citizen first. Mm -hmm. they don't, they, you know, who they work for is just a kind of secondary thing. Like, they are a person first. And you know, that's why I'm really interested, going back to it on a hobby horse, which is there have to be other ways to invest in these technologies. Yeah. Because the moment we have ways of investing in these, where, where it's no one's job to say, you know what, let's not open source that. Let's mm. try and own that and make sure we have an monopoly over that. It's just because we have this dumb thing called money, yeah. uh, which is buying up the new technologies in a kind of rather rather dumb way um, and we need to invest we need to invent a whole new bunch of ways mm -hmm. to make sure that the way that we're investing and building these technologies in the first place at least means we're having a more neutral conversation mm -hmm. where it takes away the temptation to build in bad models and to and to treat people as anything other than citizens and I think at, at that point uh, it feels a bit more optimistic yeah, but if you, if you look at what's happening today and we see more and more sort of um, participatory budgets or a city that has an app where you can, you know, say what you don't like, and everyone says, yeah, "Well, do they actually uh, is, are they actually making any decisions?" No. Now? Yeah, and I think the, the, the code that's still running those things is still written in legal code. Yeah, and there is the thing. There is a the problem. We're gonna, you know, write a uh, a service for that or, or an app for that, and I'm sure that's gonna, you know. Yeah, but I think with with, with current state of technology, we're mostly in a legal kind of revolution. We're mm -hmm. in really in. All other revolutions aside, uh, manufacturing and mm -hmm. um, even um, well, well, everything else, but, but we are really in a legal revolution because we, if we are able to um, create this other space of legality which is based on decisions made by some um, computational entities which we have actually And programmed. it's very much visible in the digital space. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking again, we, uh, we must be more literate in um, and more, um, not only literate, but we must be really creative with the way these legislations are going to take mm. place, the, in the way we will um, outsource decision making of, uh, about what's going to happen in a city and who is going to be reliable for that. And, right. Um, yeah. And I think this is one of the things that will force this. It won't. Mm. It's sad to say, because I you know, imagine there's a lot of people in this room who are kind of like, like cast us sort of half, we're all a bunch of half activists, aren't we? But, and, and by the way, God, it's important that we are, right? You know, the whole thing about a small group of citizens is the mm -hmm. only thing that changed the world. But actually, when we actually get to the tipping points, I suspect liability and insurance, yeah. this is something that in my colleague Indy Johar talks about very eloquently, um, will become the driver. Because mm -hmm. the, idea, the, the liability, the exposure to liability will become unbearable. Mm -hmm. um, and actually it will drive change from the other end. Mm. Yeah, those are very big topics. So I, I think we can't, we can't decide. First of all, we can't put ourselves at the center of the decision-making process. And I think that's going to be a, a, a huge challenge because, as, as we've said, moving from designing lamps and chairs yeah. into designing legislation and... Uh, I, I mean, I think one... Basically designing legislation, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I think one rule of thumb to kind of take with you as a designer is... Um, and I, I, I personally am not... And again, in, in, Indy says the same. Um, when we talk about liquid democracy, the problem is that we tend to put too much burden on, on the vote and mm -hmm. reinventing the vote. But in, you know, and I apologize because, you, sort of, you know, you get fed up with me saying this, this mantra all the time, but mm -hmm. the word democracy is demos kratos, it's people power. Mm -hmm. And that power can be any kind of power. It can be electrical power, mm -hmm. it can be the power to make, it can be the power to produce. So the more structurally robust and commonsensical you have your diagram of power in any given situation, the less you need the vote. Ironically, and I'm not sure whether I believe this, but screw it, I'm going to say it anyway. Um, in... in in the same way that a perfectly healthy society is not one with, with lots of hospitals, it's one with no hospitals, mm -hmm. right? Similarly, a perfectly democratic society is not long, one with lots of voting, it's actually one with no voting. Mm -hmm. Because power is already so well distributed, distributed. And, and, um, and negotiated in a day-to-day -day level that actually you don't need any centralized things where mm. we, you know, uh, ha and, and that's kind of a slightly uh, mad statement, but um, it's, a, it's a kind of different way of... Um, kind of maybe approaching it more like a kind of a habit or a design tactic to keep in your back pocket when you're designing mm. an app or a system or a service. You go, right, who should own what? Yeah, in, and like the topic of ownership, and right. especially when you, when you move into sharing data right. and transparency and, and open who, who data. Who should own this decision and who should own the responsibility yeah. for the consequences of that decision, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I think what, what is going to be an interesting niche uh, in design is really design with the interaction uh, with interrogation of, of AI. So, mm. 
yeah, that, that's one really great niche I would like to see uh, somehow uh, uh, flourish. E e Elon's on it, right? Mm -hmm. Elon's on it. Okay, so if, if you have no further comments, I think I'm going to give the voice to the public. Do we have a little... Yeah, yeah there is an assistant. I think it's going to be hard to answer to all those very, very deep questions during a, a panel, but I think we have you started... You mean we can't solve them? No, mm -hmm. I don't think it's the point. You know? I would like to add one more thing about uh, th that inspired me. Um, when we talked about yeah. composing design and the, the notion of publicness, that mm. uh, there is no... Um, I, I relatively recently gave a talk about composing design when they asked me to talk about the, the digital. Mm. And so, because, you know, everything can be applied to anything, the, the question was, so you have this unpleasant design theory, what would you say about the digital, the mm -hmm, web? And mm -hmm. I said, there is nothing unpleasant in yeah. the web. Yeah. There is no... Not, not such a thing. There is nothing in the web yeah. that's guaranteed to be there for you. Everything is privately owned. Yeah. And there is no such thing as unpleasant design on the web. And that's interesting if we think of the, the future of legislation. Yeah. Because maybe there will be some unpleasant design on the web in the future. Yeah, but we... What, what would that look like? It would look like, I don't know, um, it, for example, if the society would have a consensus that uh, having a Facebook account is a necessary mm. uh, identi identity... Um, yeah, it's your thing. ID card, basically. Uh, then the, the space of Facebook would become public, right. I guess. Mm. Even right. and not, not materially, not in terms of money, only in terms of social contracts. Right, but isn't that already becoming the case? This is, um, yeah. I mean, this week, uh, it, Google said they're not going to read your Gmail anymore, right? Anymore. Now, presumably, it's not because they've had an outbreak of philanthropy. <laughs> it's because they realize the thing that's most valuable to you is just your, your identity yeah. and seeing where you move around. The actual yeah. content of your emails, they can probably predict before you, before yeah. you know what they before are. Before you wrote it. Right. That's why they have so, all these um, they already know. inbox right. that can write my mail back. So already, in a way, given that governments have not created, uh, apart from Estonia, right? I don't know if any other countries have created an, yeah. a, a digital identity, but G Gmail is our de facto day-to-day -day public identity mm. now. Yeah, it's an identity, but, it, there, but, but there is really no expectation amongst any kind of a coherent group of humans that, that you would have such an account yet. Right. Yeah. There is, I will give the voice to the public, but there is, there is one thing that it's because Liz is not here. I mean, she's here, but she's not here. Not here. We can tell. Um, we had this conversation before, and there was, before we simplified, I hope I can use the word simplified this panel, uh, there was a big uh, focus on, on system design and sort of very um, academic approach to it. And we had this reflection that I found came about the feedback loops. I don't know, I guess I'm just going to explain this. When you do something, you get a feedback loop. You get a feedback, it's either positive or, or negative, but it sort of makes you do more of it or less of it, in a way. And something that is very interesting is that, I think in the way we designed for those users, and especially in the, the digital world, what's happening is like those, the, the feedback comes um, late or it's just not visible. So very often we, we don't see actually the impacts and consequences of the things that we are doing. Right. And I think, and I just wanted to add that one before we stop, is that actually, especially if you look at questions of an, an environment and the, the planetary boundaries, uh, which are moving the conversation in an absolutely different direction, but it's, it's very relevant, especially talking about agency. I think there is one thing to, to keep in mind, is that there is also this um, thing to do, especially when we're designing, is, is trying to design in a way that we we see or we understand the impact and the consequences of, of our actions. And I think this reflection about feedback, that I don't want to judge positive or negative because the negative one can be actually positive in total, is something that we're going to keep, keep in mind while we're designing the systems. Uh, the microphone out ready now. Yeah, there is a microphone. So. Um, we still have some time left, so I would love you to, to participate in the conversation and ask questions to our fantastic panelists. Is there a question? Comment or whatever. Comment. There There's is one over there.
Well, uh, probably we will not see, we talked about designers and how they will, will see change their roles or evolve to, to new areas, but um, where do you see, both of you or the three of you, uh, what's your opinion on the education, on how we will form the new designers or the people that will try to deal with the task of creating either a new system or the tools or whatever we will require, but how will we educate these people if the traditional education is not quite working for that because it's either too slow or it's too boxy, let's say. I hope it's kind of clear. Well, an, an initial answer, if I may, to that is, is that um, the reason why design education currently struggles is not because it's slow or boxy, it's because it was designed to solve a different problem. Absolutely. Right. It was designed for an industrial economy in which there was such a thing as a designer and designer was going, going to work for capital. Mm. So, um, so th there's always been this weird disjunction between the fact that design is a profession mm. and then also this other thing that, which is that design is a function of the prefrontal cortex which is one of, our, one of our most fundamental characteristics as, as humans because our ability to do it is particularly advanced compared to the other species on this planet. Um, and, uh, which is inherently a kind of civic or biological good, um, if you see what I mean. So there's something really, really interesting which in your question, straight away, which is, which, which is it you want? Like, I guess what you mean is, how do you educate for this one? Mm. And yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't know, it's just that was my... Uh, yeah, as we said, we don't need to have solutions, we mm. need to have better questions. So yeah, that's, a, that's a, a start of a good question, but I think you can only learn something by asking questions also. So. Um, I don't think there is a generic, um, I think that we, we, as we do away with the user, we also have to do away with the students. It's not possible anymore to design an education which is going to be generally good Absolutely. for everyone or because we also don't have the product anymore. Mm. And, uh, and, and what, what is going to be the product of this design? That is what they will have to create, actually. Well, uh, which goes back to the question of that bridge over, which is how you get paid. Because that's already what we start to see, where a lot of designers are becoming more entrepreneurial. You get entrepreneurial, paid in bitcoins, right? that's and, uh, it. Uh, right. <laughs> so, oh, right, it's fine. Then. Ether. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they just keep going up. Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, there is an interesting question there, which is kind of, if, if what we're seeing is that, that, that on a really practical day-to-day -day level, what that feels like for the designers is, hey, I'm not going to sit there and wait for a client to, to ask me a question anymore. I can see what needs doing, and now I need to work out how to do it. And then at some point along the way, you end up accidentally becoming an entrepreneur, and you spend none of your time designing. Um, I'm not bitter, it's fine. Um, and uh, the, uh, there's a really, the, the, you know, then goes back to this interesting question of, okay, how you then get paid, and, and that's where things like, yeah, sure, Bitcoin crowdfunding, et cetera, suggest little signs of, of, of a different kind of future. Uh, and, and you know, no, no one goes on Kickstarter video and says, here are the letters after my name, proving that I'm a qualified designer. Mm. <laughs> right? I've ne you know, said no Kickstarter video ever. <laughs> yeah, but well, we're in this space of negotiation still. I don't think it's going right. to be like that forever with the, the so-called disruptive technologies and economies. So we are in a specially permissive space now where you don't need a permission to make a, a Kickstarter no. video and perhaps you will need one in 10 years in order to even create an account on Kickstarter. You will need some kind of, um, I don't know, data a uh, Facebook packet. Account. Uh, yeah, Facebook confirmation. I mean, yeah, th this, this is... Uh, <laughs> it's come. <common. laughs> Let's stop it there. No, I think I'm just, just going to chip in because uh, I, this is part of my work, which is actually teaching industrial design. Um, you know, the old industrial design, the one done for... The product. Pro the product. The actual product. Yeah, and, and actually it's a really good question because once you come into an environment that is very much focused on doing a chair, when you actually come and say what we're going to do is we're going to think about the chair in a room, in a house, in a city, in a country, and when you actually start to think about system and context and how things interact with each other and you start to ask the questions, they say, no, 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 we want to do the design. It's like, this is design. Yeah. And, and, and no, as you've said, is a design is a part of your frontal cortex, so it's actually you know, bringing the ability to, to, as you've said, to ask the right questions and just you know, letting people know that they can ask the, those questions. I think it's, the, it's a good start. I, I think it, uh, part of this, though, is you know, to even talk about design education is problematic because it's a bit like... Do you remember in the 90s, people used to talk about a thing called the IT room? <laughs> 
Remember that in schools? Wasn't that cute? Mm. This idea that because we we aligned the whole of knowledge into these subjects. You had biology and and chemistry and and maths, and then you had another one called IT. And of course, it's laughable now because we realise, of course, that information mm -hmm. technology is horizontal. It's pervasive. Mm -hmm. It's across the whole thing. And d design is the same thing. So the idea oh. that design is is a kind of stack within somehow a knowledge system, it, it just will become laughable mm -hmm. really, really quickly. And I think that's again, that's not very controversial. Like you know, Ted talks have been saying that. I must years. intervene and say that actually the reason that IT is so per, uh, so horizontal is because it's economically viable, mm -hmm. and that's the interesting part. It's yeah, but that's always been, so that's always been true. Like, it was true of paper. Yeah. You know, yeah. when society transitioned from not having paper to having paper, yeah. right? mm. it, yeah. paper became pervasive. Yeah. Do we have another question? There are two. Um, first of all, I love your talk. Yeah, um, really brilliant. Um, great at the years, and uh, that's great. Um, but I have. Um, one uh, question to the platform you, you showed um, um, the talk before, and my question is in going this direction: um, What do we need um, besides the designers? What do we need next? Do we need um, your platform, and who owns this platform? Or um, yes, <laughs> yes, but I will ask you: um, Who owns this platform? Do you own this platform, right. society, or who owns the first step we all have to take? Right. The answer is we don't know because, as you can see, we obsess a lot about this question. Um, equally, there's a lot of hyperbole um, and speculation around you know, trying to go to this extreme technocratic future in which no one owns stuff using blockchains and stuff. And it's, you know, to call it unproven would be an understatement. Um, so um, our strategy was let's buy ourselves space um, by just setting up a non-profit organization that just kind of is the holder of, of that, literally at the moment, that IP. Um, and then the next thing, of course, is to open source stuff and to get it onto as many servers as possible. But you have to be reasonably strategic about when you do that because it has overheads, et cetera, and it has risks. Um, but um, that's, I think that is one of the big underlying questions because it comes down to ownership and liability. Um, and there are lots of questions that are around for a long time, which is how you pay people to maintain open source stuff and, you know, is, is a big unsolved question in the world. Um, so uh, the, the, the practical answer is that at the moment, which is we, we created that, but we, I, we've only conceived that as, at the moment, the legal code available, that is the best available option, is just to take the issue of ownership off the table. Because we tend to go to extremes when it comes to looking at new models of ownership. Um, like, we, we, you know, we want, actually, the, you, there's a good 80-20 rule which says, if there's an institution in the middle that doesn't have a corrupt reason to do something bad, it's much, much more likely not to. Um, so that, you know, just taking shareholders off the table was the first thing. And that was quite hard because, you know, we're still in the early days of, of, of prototyping. We're just going to start testing and piloting it. But, um, you know, the same with things like the wiki stuff, wiki house stuff we were doing, like early on, you know, these, these kind of keen VCs would come up to you and say, right, love it. You know, it's a unicorn. Like, how much money do you want? Um, and it was, they couldn't really comprehend the idea. We're saying, well, we don't really think it should be for sale. Um, it, should, it should be owned. So I, I think the short answer is we don't know, but we should at least try and buy ourselves some space. And of course, the question that Ren raises is, 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 is how, we, how we raise investment. So our current strategy um, at the moment, I think everyone should always have to ask this question of where their money comes from. Um, uh, our current strategy is, I describe it a bit like trying to um, uh, build a motorway. So instead of going to the investor and saying, here, you're going to own the motorway, and then we're going to put toll booths on it and slow the cars down so that you can take rent off it. And we're going to say, look, go to a lorry company. You know, not literally, but you get my point. Go to a lorry company and say, hey, we're going to build a motorway. Right? You don't need to own the motorway. You just want the motorway to exist. So if you work with us, you get first access to the motorway. So that's what we're trying to do and, and, and try and really build it up, down up from the grassroots up. But you know, we're really, really keen to say we, we're, we're, doing, we're, we're working on that, but we want to collaborate with everybody and we want to partner with any organization or company to kind of, to, to kind of and we set very clear rules about that. Um, because if, if we move into this norm where it's like you look at me and say, oh, he owns that, then we've got this problem. I don't Britney Spears mic. Yeah, we just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, we used to pay for crossing a bridge, and so we used to pay for infrastructure. Right. Uh, we always pay for infrastructure until it becomes really so pervasive that uh, 
With, oh yeah, it's mm -hmm. just against my voice, it's uh, filtered out, I'm, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> so, so I guess the, the use is something that's creating, um, that's, that's reducing the cost, as a, which is kind of a counterintuitive thing, but the more you use highways, the, more, the less you have to pay right. for them, the more people use highways, right. the more people need highways, the more um, car industry is going to invest or have yeah. profit from and thus uh, pay taxes or, you know, there are so many ways that, that, that costs are leveraged and, uh, and the fact that we don't ever, ever pay for bridges almost in right. the world. We do still have sometimes to pay for tunnels. But um, and in, in France, you have to pay uh, the toll on, on highways, and in some countries you don't, and in some countries you pay a fixed uh, fee. In, in Germany, you don't even pay for highways. So you, we already have this kind of really diversity of paying for infrastructure uh, at this moment, and, and this is going to happen with servers. So you, you know, every digital uh, development, even the, even the, the, the blockchain, is kind of physically relying on some private right. infrastructure. Right. Yeah, and, and this infrastructure, the ownership of this infrastructure will surely change. And this brings me to the, the back yeah. to the question of education and the environment, because I, I recently talked to a friend who also um, worked a little bit with us on the unpleasant design, and he teaches now uh, something called environment design yeah. and at, at, uh, at Carnegie Mellon. And, yeah. and this is something they invent. Of course, you can think of what is environment design, mm. but it's not about environmental design that's yeah, environmentally environment friendly. Design. It's just about bringing design out of this uh, yeah. box of uh, whether industrial or graphic it's or... It's the one with Cameron, uh, it's Cameron, with Cameron Tonkinwise. It's, it's with Cameron Tonkinwise at Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. You, can, you can imagine a whole new yeah. thing, can't you? You have happiness design. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, yeah, that, that exists in Rotterdam. There was a course called Leisure Management, <laughs> a, a master, I think. Yeah, a master in Leisure Management. I, leisure and management. go for that one. <laughs> um, in both... Uh, Political governance and, and architectural design, do you think there's a role for uh, a well-intentioned paternalism or the role for experts? Because um, it sounds like um, if you make everything participatory, that means dominance of the amateurs. And we saw the dangers of that in ele elections in many countries, and especially in architectural design, that's arts. And I think there's a role for, for you know, maestros, and uh, we don't want to see everything owned by the amateurs, you know, you want, it's good to be able to design your own curtain, but, you know, sometimes you want the professionals to design. So, so what do you think about these, the role of experts? Yeah, we get this one a lot. Um, uh, it's, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a perfectly uh, valid question. Um, I think it, from, and maybe you can kind of read this between the conversation that we've, we've been having, but I can see in particular, the idea that there's a future in which no expert, is there are no experts is terrifying, right? Of course you need experts. Um, it just it doesn't look the same way as it does today. So immediate um, roles for the expert that you can see are um, initially the, the initial founders, right, or the initial creators of a thing at this, uh, this infant stage mm -hmm. when you're creating a new framework and there has to be some accountability. And, and, and you know, this thing of Linus Torvald said is the job of an open source founder is to make yourself unemployed as quickly as possible. But until you're unemployed, you have a duty of care, you have a responsibility, and that's... It's, you know, it's, that's a delicate, that's a difficult space. So the, the role of the professions and the experts, if you like, is always to do the next thing, because that's the thing that there isn't a framework to stop people going wrong on. You know, and the, and the principle that drives the, the bits of plywood in WikiHow's Ren all the way up to everything that we're working on is the Japanese concept of poker yoke, which is this idea of mistake proofing. Until you've mistake proofed it, and there's no such thing as perfect mistake proofing, but um, until you've mistake proofed it, obviously it's not, you know, it can only be there someone who knows what they're doing. So um, that's one answer is, is in, the, in, the, in, the, in the early formative stages, the, the key thing is you don't want to get locked into a thing where you're just paying a professional to do the same thing over and over and over again, which is the current situation that we, we get in. And when architects come up to us and say, uh, talk about automation, say, oh my God, are, are we going to be unemployed in the future? You know, I say, look, we've got to find a way in about 35 years to support a global population of nine and a half billion with zero fossil fuels. The idea that we're going to run out of design problems anytime soon is laughable, right? So it's fine. 
Um, and, but the other thing, of course, is, is the bit we've talked about, which is the accountability and ongoing maintenance of these, of these automation tools, right? Which is, who asks the question? Yeah, but what if, or why, or, or how could that be better, or et cetera, et cetera. Who, it, who is it who drills down, and becomes more and more expert, and then turns around to the world and say, hey, everyone, look, I've seen a bug in the code. Right? So that, that is a really, really important role of the citizen expert. And it's going to be all kinds of interesting things about what the future kind of version of Hippocratic Oaths looks like. Yeah, I, I would like to support this uh, moving to another level. It's not really about doing away with experts. I don't really like the word expert because it assumes um, some kind of... Um, it assumes an unquestionable expertise Authority. on something which itself is really changing. So experts in what? But I, I, I'm absolutely uh, not pro um, the situation in which everyone, everyone. is uh, doing everything and not, nobody's really knowing what is... Um, what is liable for what's going on, um, not who is liable, but really what is liable. Uh, and there I think the, the whole orientation is towards uh, moving to this other level of system design, which is beyond, um, beyond answering the question, which color is this concrete wall going to be, um, which somehow has concerned designers for a long time. And I would like to bring up this uh, beautiful um, artwork by uh, Tom Waits, who made this toaster. Oh, um, yeah. You know, this artist, he, he went back and kind of uh, hand produced a toaster from scratch, from every mineral that you need to mm. uh, acquire. And this shows exactly the expertise um, that he doesn't have, but nevertheless, he's able to produce this pro toaster. But this is not what we want to do, you know, mm -hmm. this is not what we want to. Uh, keep doing. There are better ways to produce toasters today, right. and we should acknowledge that. I think this project actually acknowledges that. Yeah. And I think uh, we also have a kind of, we do have a naivety. I mean, uh, uh, one of my you know, favorite quotes is Larry Lessig. Um, you know, if you want to understand a society, don't look at what they argue about, look at what they take for granted. Mm -hmm. Right? And that, that, that's why, I, personally, I, I, I'm a designer, because um, uh, design is in concerned with the game of what people take for granted. And um, what's really interesting is we're quite naive about the stack that has already been built up upon us. And that the Toaster Project, was that's what the Toaster Project was about. It illustrated so beautifully how you have to have the invention of mathematics before you can, you know, there's this, this huge stack um, that we are, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants is the biggest understatement ever, right? Um, and, you know, th there's lots of very interesting things about that because we tend to be quite short-termist and forget that, for example, that you have to, hitherto, you have to have a lot of slavery or a lot of fossil fuels before mm. citizens have the word citizen, mm. or societies have the word citizen and si or human rights. It just doesn't exist. It's never existed in a society that doesn't have loads and loads of slavery or fossil fuels. So are we so going to have to... Yeah. And the time is running out, uh, so we're going to stop here, but I invite you really strongly to continue the discussion because I think it's just the beginning. I think if I want to sum it up, I want to say that I think there is a new approach that, that should uh, occur, one that is actually um, you know, thinking and, and approaching a different kind of growth. I, I think that's something that we really have to, have to keep in mind, and, and one that doesn't place the designer and the user at the center of the approach, but that is part of the whole process. One that takes into consideration the whole strategy and, 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 and context. Um, so thank you very much. That's, that's all for this discussion. But I, if you're interested in the topic, I have a little announcement. Uh, we're going to be having a workshop tomorrow at uh, 6, from 6 to 7.30. You can find it in the program. It's called Disrupt and Hold Space, Using Co-Design to Rebalance Power Dynamics in the City. That's kind of trying to apply some of the theories that, um, that we have just mentioned. And uh, as we are kind of running short of time, uh, we're going to move directly to the next session. So thank you very much.